Hello, uh, welcome to uh, Windows on Advent. We turn to Isaiah chapter 9 once again, and today is day 13 of this series of thoughts on the Old Testament prophecies which prepare us for the birth of the Lord Jesus. Obviously, uh, in our calendar, we celebrate the birth of the Lord Jesus on December the 25th, and Advent is this season that traditionally takes us through till December the 24th. So we're moving into the second half, if you like, of Advent. Yesterday, we began to consider Isaiah chapter 9, verses 6 and 7. So I'll read those verses to you again. To us, a child is born. To us, a son is given. And the government will be on his shoulders. And he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. The zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. And, and yesterday we began to consider this passage and, and looked at it in context, the context, uh, Old Testament context, uh, King Ahaz and Isaiah, all that background story of Emmanuel from Isaiah chapter 7 and how Ahaz turned from trusting the Lord and put his trust in men. In fact, he went to the very enemy who was going to be the destruction of the northern kingdom of Israel and also of Syria and eventually would turn Israel into a puppet uh, dynasty uh, where they were constantly paying out tribute and so in one sense we said this is the end of the freedom of the kings of Israel because Ahaz refuses to accept the sign that God is with us Emmanuel when we came into chapter 9 we saw how there was a promise of a coming child and this child was going to be an amazing character and you can't just see this king, this future king, as an earthly uh, person, can you? It's impossible to, to say that th this amazing king is going to be Emmanuel, God with us, that he's going to be the wonderful counsellor, the mighty God, the everlasting father, the prince of peace. There's got to be more to that than merely another king in the dynastic line of King David. Now remember that what we're looking at here is how the promise that God gives to Adam and Eve, but also the doom that he lays on the serpent in Genesis chapter 3, is that there would be enmity between the seed of the serpent, which means is in picture form is is satan and the seed of the woman and time and again we are looking for one who is going to come who is going to finally crush the serpent one who is going to destroy the works of the evil one of satan and we saw how that would have to be a son of adam it would have to be a human being that was what the promise was back in genesis and that was taken then and it was re refined into being a son of abraham so it had to be a jew and then later it had to be from one of the tribes of Israel. So we are, um, we're getting narrower and narrower. It's ever decreasing circles, as I said. It had to be from the tribe of Judah. It had to be in the line of David. So have we finally come to this child who is going to crush the serpent? Well, not in the time of Ahaz, nor in the time of Isaiah. Remember, we talked about Isaiah um, ministering between 740 um bc and um probably about 686 bc uh history has it that manasseh the son of king hezekiah has him sawn in half and he turns up doesn't he in um hebrews 11 as one of the the figures of faith and ultimately this one who is going to come and crush the serpent has to not only be the son of adam the son of abraham the son of david but also the son of god emmanuel god with us and that can't be until the lord jesus comes let's look at some of these titles then he is called wonderful wonderful counselor 
and I said how this was a word that suggested supernatural in the Hebrew. Time and again, when the Lord Jesus acts, people are amazed at him. They were amazed at the words that he spoke because he'd had no kind of formal training. And yet he spoke as though he knew what he was talking about. He's bringing new things out rather than just repeating as the other Pharisees were doing the things of old. When the shepherds hear about the birth of the Lord Jesus, they go to Bethlehem and they come home. Uh, glorifying God. They're amazed at the things they've seen. So this child is to be wonderful. We said he's the wonderful counsellor. And last time I said the counsellor pointed to him being a king. Um, the counsellor would maybe sit at the gate and would um, minister, administer justice. Remember the story of David. David gets a little bit lax in his rule and Absalom, his son, um, having been forgiven, for some tawdry business with uh, one of his own family um, the, where he rapes uh, his own sister Tamar um, and then has um, Amnon killed as well. Absalom is brought back into the king's favour and uh, worms his way into the affections of the people by going down to the gate of the city uh, and saying, oh, if only there were a king here or a dispense justice. And in the end, a rebellion is fermented and um, David is driven out. And ultimately, Absalom is killed by Joab. David mourns him, but uh, it was right that that should have happened. And, and so a, a king would be a counsellor. Uh, and, and Jesus speaking to the disciples in John uh, 14, 15, says to them, I'll send you another counsellor, one just like me. I've got to go back to the Father, but I'll send you another counsellor, the Holy Spirit. And I've shared this before, but the word for another here is the word alos in, um, in, uh, in, in, in Greek. Jesus could have used the word, or John, when writing it down, could have used the word heteros, which means another, but of a different kind. Uh, and the example I've given in the past has been where I've said, well, imagine, you know, you've got a bottle of milk on the step and uh, a babe comes and pecks the top of it and you shout to the milkman, hey, Milko, look what's happened here. I want another. And he says, well, do you want another blue top or a green top or an orange top? I'll have another that exactly the same. I had blue top. I want another blue top. If John had used the word heteros, the counsellor who um, came would have been different. It would have been like a green top rather than the blue top. But he uses the word alos. And so when Jesus says, I'll send another counsellor, it's another just like him because Jesus is God in the same way that the Holy Spirit is God, in the same way that God the Father is God. It's an alos. Like you have an allotrope, don't you, of an element, one or two different forms of the same element. Or an allosaurus was a, a, another uh, dinosaur, but they weren't quite sure exactly what it was. So he's a wonderful counsellor. He's mighty God. Now, you know, the power of his word, the Lord Jesus, he sustains the universe, we're told in the book of Hebrews. He heals at a distance when um, the centurion uh, comes. He says, you don't need to come, just say the word. Jesus says, I've never seen such faith, even in all Israel. Jesus speaks the word and the centurion's servant uh, and the royal official servant in another story are healed at a distance. He stills the storm, he muzzles the storm with a word. He says, be still, and it, it is still. And when he says to the dead Lazarus, having been in the tomb four days, Lazarus, come out. Lazarus comes forth, the power of mighty God. Who is this man? Say the disciples uh, as they are aboard the ship. Who is this man? He, uh, he stills the storm and when Jesus raises from the dead, uh, sorry, raises from his bed, rather, the man who's been uh, paralysed for a long time, when Jesus raises the paralysed man from his bed, sick bed, um, and says, well, you know, your sins are forgiven you. The Pharisees say, who is this man who can forgive sins? Only God can forgive sins. And the Lord Jesus in a debate with the Pharisees, uh, which is picked up in a number of passages in John. But John says, you know, why are you getting so hot under the collar uh, about me um, suggesting that I'm God? Why are you getting so? Uh, it does, isn't it written in the Psalms? I have said you are gods. 
And so though the Lord Jesus doesn't go around saying, I am the son of God. He is the son of God. And scripture itself points clearly to that. Our great God and saviour, the Lord Jesus Christ in the book of Titus. But the, uh, the Pharisees were really enraged that Jesus was going around calling God his father, making himself equal with God. These are divine titles. We've only looked at two of them here. The wonderful counsellor, how Jesus amazed people with the things that he did, how wise he was, how he spoke as though he actually knew the heart uh, and purposes of God. And the mighty God, the power that he demonstrated in healing people, raising people from the dead, stilling the storm and calling God his own father. We'll pick that up uh, next time round when we consider how the everlasting father also refers to the Lord Jesus. But until now, may the Lord bless you and keep you, make his face shine upon you and give you his peace at this Advent season.